Hi, I'm Josh Hawkins, and this is episode 63 of Opening Up the Gospels. In the last episode, I spent some time introducing the first major event that we see in this Middle Galilean period, the Sermon on the Mount. I talked about some of the common misconceptions we have related to when this sermon happened and where it was given. I also talked generally about how the sermon is radically divisive and how that's directly in line with one of the major themes of Jesus' ministry, which was really to expose the hearts of the people of Israel, to divide them, to separate the wheat from the chaff. It's with this in mind that I want to look at some of the content of the sermon, both from Luke and Matthew's account. Specifically, I want to look at some of the Beatitudes today, the, really the portion of the Sermon on the Mount that many people are probably already somewhat familiar with. So let's read from Luke's account, starting in Luke 6. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets." But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. I mentioned this in the last episode, but I'll say it again here. Do you see the contrast between the two types of people Jesus is giving here? The poor, the hungry, the ones who weep, the ones who are hated and reviled for Jesus' sake are the ones who will be blessed in the age to come. They receive a place in the coming kingdom where they will be filled with joy, will have great reward on that day. But the ones who are rich and satisfied, laughing and spoken well of, all receive woes. It's not going to go well for them in that day. Now remember the audience and remember the context. These are Jewish hearers here who believe that their ethnicity and their external adherence to the law of Moses is what guaranteed them the promises of the kingdom and the resurrection and the Abrahamic blessing in the age to come. The Pharisees, the scribes, and the Jewish authorities were the epitome of righteous men. They were the ones who had wealth and power and provision, and they were well spoken of. The ordinary people were the poor, the non-religious, the non-righteous people, according to the Pharisees. So do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus is framing the issue of inheriting the promise as not an external one, but an internal one. I want to take a look at a few of the Beatitudes now. I'm not going to cover all of them, but I do want to give you a feel for a couple of them. So let's look here at the first one in Luke. Jesus says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Jesus opens up the sermon with some very similar words to John the Baptist. Both of them use the phrase, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, in modern times, there's all sorts of differing opinions on what the kingdom actually is. The confusion, I think, is just based on Greek philosophical thought, and I'll talk much more about that in a future episode. But the Jewish people who heard John and Jesus speak would have understood their words about the kingdom as referring to the future final government based in Jerusalem that would crush all the other kingdoms of the earth and that would reign forever. I don't believe that we should understand the kingdom as some spiritual reality or simply as God's presence in our heart or in a meeting or something like that, but rather a geopolitical earthly kingdom based in Jerusalem ruled by a descendant of David called the Christ or the Messiah. As we'll see throughout the Gospels, Jesus never redefines what the kingdom of God was from how the Jews understood it, but what he does do is clarify who would actually inherit it and who wouldn't. Now, remember, that's exactly what John the Baptist was doing, right? He said the ones who bore the fruits of repentance would be the ones who would be the wheat, the ones who would receive the Spirit, and the ones who would be the rightful descendants of Abraham, and thus the ones who would receive the promises. So here in this first beatitude, Jesus is doing the same thing. He's dividing and clarifying who would inherit that kingdom. He says that the ones who are not fighting for the wealth and riches and all of that in this age, they have no need to worry because a day is coming when the king of Israel and his kingdom will deal with economics in a fair and a just way. Think about what we looked at back in episode 54, how Jesus said that he was the one that Isaiah spoke about, saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
It's not a coincidence that the first statement of the Sermon on the Mount has to do with money. Every single interaction Jesus had with the rich in the Gospels culminated in a strong exhortation to sell everything and give it to the poor, to join the poor, or to store up treasure for the coming kingdom. Think about what John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3. I mean, so much of it is related to money and possessions and how the Jewish people were to respond to his message of repentance. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. When Jesus sits on David's throne in Jerusalem, the kingdom he will establish will overthrow all of the other kingdoms, including their corrupt economic systems that either oppress or don't adequately care for the poor. That day would be so severe for the rich and all those who have allegiance to another kingdom or another system. It's a big deal that Jesus is saying this because the Jewish authorities, especially those in Jerusalem and those in charge of the temple, they were extremely wealthy. Of course, they were the ones who thought that they would be the true children of Abraham, the ones who would get the promise and be rulers in the Messiah's kingdom. But just like John the Baptist, Jesus is saying, nope, bear the fruits of repentance. You need a clean heart. That's how you'll inherit the coming kingdom. Now, Matthew says this a little bit differently. He says... Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's no contradiction between Luke and Matthew here, because in Jewish thought, there was a common association between poverty and piety, or as Matthew says it, poor in spirit. Those who were not weighed down with riches and possessions in this age would be able to more easily set their hope on the glory of the age to come. And those who are in distress because of their poverty, they have God as their only confidence. Of course, there's so much in the New Testament about the perils of finding our security and our hope in money as well. And I think this beatitude is underlined by Isaiah 61, a passage we've already looked at, where the connection between the poor and the poor in spirit is highlighted even more. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Of course, Jesus is the one who's going to do this. We looked at this a little bit back in episode 54. Well, let's look at one more beatitude in this episode today from Matthew's gospel. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Once again, Jesus addresses an issue of the heart. Showing mercy involves being generous, forgiving others, having compassion for the suffering, and providing healing of every kind. As we've already seen and as we'll continue to see throughout the Gospels, the Pharisees and the scribes are often the furthest from this. They constantly are pointing out faults and they're exalting themselves. This beatitude in Matthew really parallels Jesus' words in Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus is saying that the merciful will receive mercy. The mercy he's talking about is ultimately an inheritance in the promises God made through the covenants that he made with Israel. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is overtly eschatological, and it's dividing between those who would inherit the coming kingdom and those who wouldn't. There's a few New Testament verses that come to mind that are connected to this theme of mercy and the end of the age. First, Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Also, 2 Timothy 1. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So do you see what's going on here? 
the Beatitudes in context to the story of the Gospels we've looked at thus far are more than just good suggestions for the church on how to live. They're radically divisive statements for the Jewish people that are addressing internal realities of the heart, not external rules of observance. God was seeking repentance and relationship with his people, Israel. The qualification or the designation of the one who would inherit the kingdom is not ethnicity or external observance, but internal heart reality. The teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees was so different from Jesus' teaching. The scribal teaching left the heart completely untouched, and the heart is what Jesus is going after here in the Sermon on the Mount. No wonder why the crowds were utterly astonished at his teaching. Well, we are totally out of time for this episode, but we'll look more at the Sermon on the Mount in the next episode as well. You can find all the other episodes in the series on my website, www.joshuahawkins.com gospels. God bless you all, and I'll see you.